a young woman would be found brutally murdered, and 17 years later, police would be shocked to learn that she was just the beginning. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Tina Jefferson. Viewer discretion is advised. Just a heads up, there are going to be a lot of people I'm talking about in this video, and unfortunately, I cannot find enough information on pretty much most of them. Veronica Tina Jefferson, and she would go by Tina throughout her life. She was born in Lawton, Oklahoma, um, and she went to and graduated from Eisenhower High School. She was a member of the National Honor Society there. She would go on to be president of her sorority. And this was at Oklahoma State University. And then after that, she got a job with the CIA. Yeah. Uh, so she moved to Washington, D.C., the Virginia area. Um, and she loved doing what she did. She was an analyst there. Specifically, I guess, in the accounting department. It's got to be pretty cool, though, just to say you work with the CIA. Kind of jealous. Her mom would describe her as definitely a mama's girl, uh, that even as an adult, you know, in her early 20s, um, she would still come and jump on, you know, her mom's lap and just give her a big hug and, and just, she was just a sweet, kind person. Unfortunately, it seems to be primarily the sweet, kind people who horrible things happen to. By May of 1988, Tina Jefferson was 24 years old. In the early morning hours of May 11th, 1988, this is approximately 3 o'clock in the morning, behind McKinley Elementary School, which is in Arlington, Virginia, a body would be discovered, which they would eventually determine uh, was the body of Tina Jefferson. Tina had been shot to death. Um, her clothes had been taken off of her body. They were not ripped off. Um, the officers made note of that. This, so this didn't appear to be to them like a struggle or the person who did it ripped them off of her in an act of rage. They almost thought maybe she took them off herself, um, possibly. Uh, maybe thinking that she knew this person. That was just a theory. But they did determine that she was actually sexually assaulted. Um, and then she was shot afterwards and then just left there. Left on the property of an elementary school as well. That's just, it's great. What if kids were the ones to discover her? Then again, I don't think the killer would actually care. Something police could not find right away was her car, but that would be discovered the following day. She drove a little red Camaro and her car was actually parked in the parking lot of, I guess, a store called the Giant Supermarket and that's near Columbia Pike. Basically, it's a store she shopped at a lot um, and she literally lived just down the street from the store. When police found her car, they of course did extensive, uh, you know, evidence checks on it. They dusted it for fingerprints uh, and they determined that the car was likely completely wiped down because they found no fingerprints. Police did find a receipt in her car for the giant supermarket, um, and it was timestamped around 9.30 p.m. So police go to the store and they begin to question everyone who was working there that night. Police were working under the theory that she had come into contact with her killer at the store um, and then maybe took off in another vehicle with, with this person and left her car behind. That made, they were a little suspicious about that theory though, because Tina's purse and all of her belongings, like her cash and everything, were still in her car um, and nothing was stolen. They did also find a box cutter in her car, um, which did was not something she owned. Um, and it didn't, because I know a lot of supermarkets, a lot of retail stores also use box cutters, so they kind of looked at the box cutters that the supermarket used and it wasn't the same type so it was a different box cutter but that also yielded no physical evidence no fingerprints or anything but after interviewing a whole bunch of employees um, there were several people who said yep we definitely saw her in the store i mean they recognize her she's there all the time she did not ever appear to look like she was in distress she was smiling um 
she was in her normal mood. They would also run basically a DNA comparison because they did collect um, some male bodily fluid uh, from Tina's body. And they ran that DNA against all of the male employees in the store. Um, and at this time, it wasn't super extensive testing, but they could kind of narrow down to like blood types. And also, I guess the DNA for what was left behind with Tina had a very rare, I guess, aspect to it that only occurs in 4% of people. Um, and none of the men from the grocery store had that kind of profile and it was they were none of them were a match. They also ran the DNA against all of the male people in her life. Uh, friends, possibly exes, matched absolutely no one. A couple of days after she was murdered, a uh, police officer came forward uh, to say that he thinks he saw Tina uh, that night. This officer stated that at approximately 9.45 or so, he believes he saw Tina's red Camaro driving kind of, not erratically, but sort of just sort of kind of swerving a little bit. Um, and then he noticed the car take a very sharp right turn and it like ran over a curb. He was able to tell from his car that whoever was driving was yelling at someone in the passenger seat. There was like an argument going on. Um, and then, I guess, she stops the car, she gets out, she again goes to the passenger side of the car and starts to talk to someone in her car. And she gets back in. He didn't see the car pull away, um, but he decided at that point, uh, you know, they're not doing anything illegal, uh, so he just sort of left the area. Tina's friends did give police the names of a couple of people who may have been possible troublesome individuals in her life. Police questioned them. They got DNA from them. No match. They also, I believe, tested that police officer, by the way. Not a match. Then in May of 1989, this is a year later, a, a couple uh, would go to police to say that they think they saw Tina at the store that night. The husband went to the deli counter to get some stuff and he says he saw Tina there originally by herself. And then he saw uh, an African-American man uh, walk up next to her and start talking to her. He said based on what he can remember, the body language and the conversation did not appear that the two of them had actually known each other prior to this. That this was like, just a random dude who saw a beautiful woman and decided to like hit on her. And then the wife of this guy later on in the parking lot saw uh, Tina and this unknown man talking next to Tina's car. Interestingly enough, the officer who saw Tina that night, um, he said that it appeared based on body language and the, the tone of voice that Tina was giving to the unknown person in the car, he said it appeared they absolutely knew each other. Um, so you have like these two contradicting witnesses, one saying they knew each other that it looked like, and one saying it didn't look like the two of them knew each other. Regardless, uh, the, the couple who saw Tina, uh, they gave police um, a description of the man and they came up with a composite drawing um, and they described as a, a young African-American male they guessed that he was a little over six foot tall, um, approximately 170, 180 pounds. He had a uh, like a bigger build, like a like a bodybuilder type thing. They said, but police never found anyone who matched that description. Um, and unfortunately, Tina's case went cold. It appears to be possibly a stranger on stranger crime, or a tiff between people who did know each other. And that causes a problem with the investigation because it's like we have to like now go in two different directions to try to find this person, but they had no luck either way. It wouldn't be until 2000 when there was an update on the case. So basically what they did was they took the DNA found on Tina and they put it into the system and they found a hit, not towards a suspect, but towards other victims. The DNA found on Tina matched DNA that was found on another woman whose name was Rachel Raver. 
On December 6th, 1988, uh, this is several months after Tina's murder, there were uh, people, hunters or something, walking around this wooded area that was described as an area that was completely out of the way, an area that people would rarely ever go into. But as these people are searching around, they find a body. And it was a female whose clothing had been removed and she had been shot to death. When police arrive and they begin searching the area, they're basically putting the caution tape up. And as they're doing so, they find another body. And this is a body of a man lying on his stomach, fully clothed. He too had a gunshot wound to his head. They would be identified as 22-year-old Rachel Raver and her 22-year-old boyfriend, Warren Fulton. This, by the way, is in Ruston, Virginia, um, so not too far from where Tina was found. Warren Fulton uh, was the captain of the uh, George Washington University baseball team. He had dreamt of one day making the majors. Rachel had actually graduated from the same school uh, just shortly before uh, this happened. She planned to eventually become a lawyer because her next step in the educational process was law school. So police would track down the friends of Rachel and Warren and they wanted to get like a timeline. The last time that anyone saw Rachel and Warren alive was actually on the evening of December 3rd, 1988, three days before they're found. Rachel and Warren were actually at a bar in Washington DC with their friends and they left the bar together, um, Rachel and Warren, uh, around 12.30 in the morning. So police again look into their lives, look for possible exes, they look for any people in their lives who may be considered enemies. Um, but once again, kind of like Tina, there, there is nothing. Uh, there's nothing nefarious in their lives. There's no jilted lovers, no quarrels going on, it, it, nothing. And so it's like, is this another stranger on stranger incident? And what was the motive? Well, it was sexual. Because uh, police believe that whoever did this somehow came across Rachel and Warren that night, obviously, and pointed a gun at them uh, and basically forced them to drive from D.C. to where eventually they were found in Virginia, which was, by the way, it was behind like... They're found, I guess, behind a church um, in, a, you know, in that kind of wooded area behind a church. But no one can recall hearing gunshots. No one can recall hearing screams. No one saw anything around that church. No one saw anything around the area that night. But it's believed that the, that's where the two were killed. Police think that Warren had to have been shot first because Warren's, you know, the big guy. Uh, he's not the target. Rachel is because it's sexually motivated crime here. So he just shoots Warren in the head. Um, and then he, they believe, because she, because Rachel had a, a gunshot wound that was non-fatal to another part of her body. So it's believed that he, the killer shot her there first, sexually assaulted her, and then shot her in the head to finish her off. It does seem that Rachel, based on that, that Rachel had tried to run away um, after her boyfriend was just shot. Um, and that's why the guy shot her somewhere else to get her to stop. And kind of like with Tina, uh, Rachel's car also was missing. But it wouldn't be until six weeks later when her car was found. And the only reason why it was found is because uh, Rachel's mom got a, a letter in the mail. It was a ticket for Rachel's car uh, because the car had been found basically parked but burnt to a crisp. And it was found all the way in Queens, New York. And believe it or not, that car had been left there just the day after the murders. Um, but apparently it wasn't ticketed uh, for quite some time or the mom just didn't get the ticket for quite some time but it just sat there burnt. It was completely just hollowed out because the whatever fire damage just annihilated everything. So there was no evidence in it, no fingerprints, no DNA, nothing. 
But there was DNA left on Rachel, which they collected, and that's how they eventually would, in 2000, they would match, they would get that connection between Rachel and Tina. And it was actually Rachel's mom who saw Tina's case being covered on Unsolved Mysteries. And that's, that's, that's really how these got linked, that's how the DNA finally uh, matched, because the mom felt this was the same type of thing. And at first, police were like, no, because, you know, Rachel and Warren, they're white, Tina is black, can't be the same person. What? That's not a thing. <laughs> and so finally, when that DNA came back, police were like, oh, okay, I guess it is the same. Yeah, no, okay, thanks. So now... There's a confirmed serial killer out there. His DNA still isn't matching to a person that committed these crimes. We just know at this point that there is a connection between three people. Now, the next portion of this is going to be about uh, a few more victims um, who I there's really no obituaries for. I only have a, pictures of a, of a couple of them. Unfortunately, some, some of them, the stuff is just hard to find. On September 2nd, 1989 near Prince William Forest Park uh, in Virginia. The body of 27-year-old Manuel Cermeno uh, was found. He was found shot to death and inside of his vehicle that was on fire. Um, he had been dead before the fire, um, and this was along the I-95. Uh, unfortunately, he's the, one of the victims I don't have a photo for and I don't have much info on. But as of back in 1989, this was just what appeared to be a random homicide, and there was almost no evidence, nothing, to go by. On May 5th, 1990, now we're in Rubido, California. So we're all the way across the country. 19-year-old Stacy Segrist and 21-year-old Tony Giannuzzi, both of them were found shot to death. And Stacy had also been sexually assaulted and there was DNA left behind on her. Now, because this is all the way in California and these other cases had taken place in Virginia, this is the late 80s, there was no big you know, nationwide system in place to plug in information and say, yep, this matches that case in California. That hadn't existed yet. On June 2nd, 1990, two more bodies are found. 71-year-old Lula Farley and her 65-year-old husband, Herbert Farley, uh, they were found shot to death. Well, actually, Lula was found shot to death first, and then a couple of weeks later, her husband was found shot to death. What happened to them, um, and this is now in, in Ontario, California, apparently Lula and Herbert would collect, like, recyclable stuff, you know, behind... Um, like supermarkets, like in the in the recycling bins and dumpsters. So apparently, uh, it, what it appeared to have happened, based on what witnesses heard, was that there was some sort of altercation that took place behind a supermarket. I don't know exactly how police came to this conclusion, um, but I guess Lula and Herbert were behind a grocery store, and it's believed that the two of them had been abducted by someone um, because they had been reported missing. But then they were clearly taken away from that area and then Lula was found shot to death in one location and then two weeks later Herbert was found. And then on September 2nd, 1990, there was another victim. This was the youngest victim. Her name was Yvette Woodruff. A man named Alfredo Prieto, uh, along with uh, a few accomplices, Vincent Lopez and Danny Sorian. They robbed a man named Anthony Rangella. Then they basically kidnapped Anthony after robbing him. They drove Anthony to, I guess, another location um, where Anthony's aunt lived um, and also uh, Anthony's niece lived. And so when all of these men got there, they took all of these people hostage and robbed them, um, but then would end up taking someone from the house. And that was the 15-year-old friend of the niece who lived in the house, um, and the friend was Yvette Woodruff. The group of men took the three women from the house um, and put them into their car and then took off with the intent of sexually assaulting them. They brought the women to this like abandoned location, this desolate area, where they sexually assaulted them. And then they two of the men had stabbed 
uh, the aunt and the niece, and but both of those women would survive. Alfredo, he had a gun and he shot Yvette and that uh, killed her. Later that day, people would find the three women, um, including the body of the 15-year-old girl. Police would get information from an informant about uh, someone who had confessed to them, this informant, about committing this crime or being a part of it. And that's how police were led to Alfredo Prieto. And then his accomplices were all arrested as well. Um, now... Prieto was charged with first-degree murder, robbery, kidnapping, um, and in January of 1992, a jury found him guilty of all charges, and he was sentenced to death. I don't know the exact outcome of his accomplices. I just know that they were arrested and charged. I haven't done like a deep dive into them, but they don't have anything to do with the remainder of this case. It wouldn't be until 2005 when DNA that had been on Tina Jefferson, Rachel Raver, Stacey Segrist, and Yvette Woodruff, they were all finally connected. And then in 2005, I don't know why it didn't happen sooner because he was in jail the entire time. I don't know. But in 2005, that all of those DNA profiles, because now we have a nationwide database, uh, that can match cases from California and cases in Virginia, there was a hit for one man committing those four sexual assaults and likely murders, and that was Alfredo uh, Prieto. Now, there wasn't DNA left with Manuel Cermeno or with the murders of Lula and Herbert, but ballistics were collected from all of the crime scenes, right? And... To those who don't know, there is a pretty extensive database uh, for firearms and uh, bullets that are used in, you know, criminal cases. And they're stored, and so they would look at the, the, the bullets that were used to shoot Yvette. Because now the DNA is linking them, they can determine that it was the same gun that killed um, Tina, Rachel, Warren, Stacy, and Tony. But then they also got hits with that ammunition on a couple other cases, Manuel Cermeno and Lula and Herbert. The uh, bullets were the exact same ones. They were fired from the exact same gun that police now know for sure belonged to Alfredo. Um, and so he had now been charged, not just with uh, and sentenced for, you know, uh, Yvette's murder way back when, but now he's being charged with eight more murders. Police had no evidence linking any other person um, being involved in any of the other murders other than the, the last one that got him caught. Alfredo Prieto was born in uh, San Salvador on November 18th, 1965, and he was one of uh, six kids. Uh, it's, I guess, reported that he grew up with a very poor family. Um, they did not have much money. Food was hard to come by. Um, resources in general were hard to come by. His dad was very abusive physically, um, not just with his wife, but with the kids. Um, and so the mom would basically take the kids and leave the country. And then they would come to the United States. By 1981, they had moved uh, to the Pomona, California area. And that's where Alfredo and his siblings would go to school. He would attend and graduate from Pomona High School. But also, um, Alfredo became uh, very much into drugs and alcohol. And then he joined a gang, um, and then his life of crime basically began at a pretty young age. I guess in 1984, uh, he, so at this point, he's actually married to a woman named Sandra. They go on to have a kid together. In, uh, they had moved to like the Ontario area, and I guess Alfredo thought his wife was cheating on him. So Alfredo uh, did what any reasonable person would do, right? He got a gun and he shot three people. Yeah. It, one of the men was someone he thought was having an affair with his wife, which turned out not to be true. Um, but then I guess he just shot the other two men because they were there, but none of them died. He was arrested and charged for the shootings, but police said, eh, they were gang members anyway. Who cares? And he only spent like three years in jail for it. And then by 1987, 1988, after he got out, 
uh, he moved to Arlington, Virginia, and that's actually where his dad had moved to. His dad had been convicted of murder back in El Salvador, and after he was released for his murder, that's when he moved to the States. So, and then, I guess, reunited with son. Yeah. Yay. During uh, one of his trials, it would be discovered that Alfredo had repeatedly sexually assaulted and abused uh, his wife, um, that he had for a brief time. And then in 1989, dear old dad, uh, is, is, is arrested, uh, for committing a sexual assault on a woman. And he is put back in prison in the States this time. Uh, and then this is around the time when Alfredo decided to go on to start his murderous rampage, uh, with Tina Jefferson being his first victim that they know of. And then after committing four murders there, he moved to California where he committed five more. <sighs> what a guy. Nine murders between 1988 and 1990 across two states, Virginia and California. He had attempted to murder three more people at least when he shot those three men. Um, he had sexually abused his wife and likely other women, they believe. Uh, this guy just... Not a good dude, ever, basically. Let me give you the list of things that this man was convicted of. First degree murder with special circumstances. Three counts of kidnapping. Three counts of forcible sexual assault. Two counts of robbery. Two counts of attempted robbery. Possession of a firearm by a felon. Oh, that's just, that's just California. In Virginia, he was convicted of capital murder, sexual assault, grand larceny, grand theft auto, use of a firearm in commission of a felony. Um, and he basically got a couple more death sentences thrown in there just for good measure. Um, he got the death penalty in California and he got the death penalty in Virginia. On October 1st, 2015, at 9.17 p.m., Alfredo Prieto was executed by lethal injection. And he left behind nine bodies. Nine people with families with wives, husbands, brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, friends, so many people affected by what this man did. For every murder, it isn't just one victim. It's everyone who was a part of that victim. They're also victims. They have to live with that pain forever. All because one man, what? What really was, what was the overall motive with him? Was it robbery? Was it sexual assault? Could be all, all sorts of things. Um, but clearly he just was not wired right from the get-go. But the evidence spoke for itself. Um, you cannot, you cannot deny DNA. And this guy was a monster. One of the worst monsters that honestly I had never heard of until I started looking into this. He's not one of the names, he's not a Bundy or a Gacy or a Dahmer, but he is just as bad. But that is it for this incredibly crazy uh, and very uh, involved case. I hope you found it interesting. As usual, if you have tripped, fallen, stumbled, rolled into, caught yourself on fire, and shot your way into this video, hi, I'm Mike. I tell true crime stories. I tell four of them a week here on YouTube. I also tell one on Instagram, one on Facebook, a couple on TikTok every week. All of my links to all my socials are below in the link tree in, my, in the description. Please follow me everywhere if you like. Um, but this is my primary place, just a heads up. So yeah, please subscribe, give the video a like, and uh, and then and yeah. Next, if you would like me to cover a case, uh, you can recommend one to me by sending it to me by email. Uh, check my case list, my crime or case list in the link tree. Scroll through it, search through it, however you need to. Look for the name. If you do see it, don't email it to me. It's already there. 
I pick my cases as random as I can and I will cover it eventually. I just don't know when. If you don't see it, then email me the name, where it happened, when it happened, and eventually, I promise, I will add it to my list. 104thly, uh, I have merch. I sell t-shirts and hoodies and a wine glass and stuff, also in the link tree below. So that's the best way to support me if you like to. You don't got to, but you can if you want to. We do ship internationally. It's all made lovingly by my amazing friend Adam. He does a wonderful job. Compliments to the chef. Uh, so, yeah, that's there. And also, if you use Discord, uh, you can join my Discord server. It's a very quiet server. Very chill. Very calm. Uh, not cray cray. Be over the age of 18 to join or else you'll be kicked out of it. Uh, yeah, so it's, all, it's also below as well. But that is it for this video, true crime, a rooney dooney ding dong. So, yeah. I'm okay. <laughs> no, you're not okay. I know I'm not okay. You don't gotta tell me. It's not like I talk to myself or anything. Is this thing on? I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to end the video now uh, with my outro. Oh God, uh, outro, outro options. What do I say? Do I say, um, y'all aren't stupid fart knockers. Nope, that's not polite. Uh, goodbye, Fruit Loops. Do you want to eat my skin? I don't know what that was. I like refrigerators. Fun facts about me. Look, a pink marker. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm so awkward. I don't know how to say goodbye. I just don't. I don't know how to do it. Um, for for Narkin! That's goodbye in a language I made up. I can feel the unsubscribing happening right now. I can feel it. I can physically feel it happening to my body as we speak. People unsubscribing to me because of the stupid thing I'm doing right now. I don't even know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing right now. It's like I have no idea how to end a